You know, it's crazy. Last week, markets were bullish. Chris wants to buy another boat. And then, you know, literally within one day, you go from Thursday to Friday, markets sell off. We're going to a recession all of a sudden. Uh, unemployment slightly spikes. And Chris is telling me that, uh, you know, he, lives, he needs to live on my couch. Well, what's going on? These markets are crazy. Well, you know, coming into the weekend, we had, uh, let's face it, tech earnings were a little disappointing, right? That, that, you know, they're kind of priced to perfection. Then you had a disappointing jobs number. And then all of a sudden you got uh, a financial shift in the global markets, throws gasoline on the fire. Yeah, and this, you know, no one had probably had heard of the yen carry trade, right? Until uh, all of a sudden it, it basically uh, melted down the global markets uh, in the matter of uh, a day. <laughs> so incredible. Well, let me just clarify. First of all, Ryan, it's a yacht. Second of all, I don't want to sleep on your couch. You have an extra bedroom. That's not cool. <laughs> and then my third question is, what's a carry trade? Well, you know, a carry trade, um, it's pretty simple, right? It's where you borrow at a low interest rate and you invest at a high interest rate. And, you know, if you haven't noticed, the Federal Reserve has been raising rates just like all the other central bankers around the world, except for one country. And that's in Japan, right? We've been fighting inflation. They've been fighting deflation. So Japan, you've been able to borrow at zero for years and basically invest anywhere else in the world. Um, and the preferred yeah. trade was uh, 5% treasuries or tech stocks. What's well, amazing, a trade like that can work for so long, and it's almost like a no-brainer, quote-unquote. Then you just need one move. Uh, the Bank of Japan raises interest rates, so all of a sudden you don't have zero rates back in good old Japan, and it unwinds that trade uh, in mass, right, <laughs> across the globe. And, you know, how many... I don't know how many billions upon billions of dollars were in that trade, but it gets all unwind at the same time uh, and everyone has to sell at the same time. And this is why you can't really predict markets ahead of time because no one predicted that two weeks ago, uh, just like no one predicted the pandemic. It's the things you don't know that really drive the market. Well, it's like in all other financial disasters, um, and you know any investor can wait out volatility, right? That's what we, our investors do. We we take advantage of volatility, but the reason these guys can't wait out volatility is because they're using leverage, and they got something called a margin call, where you know suddenly the bank says you got to put more money in, and these traders are going, well, wait a minute, I I don't have any more money to put in, so they are forced to sell, and that selling begets more selling because other people that are margin and borrowing, now all of a sudden they get a margin call. So margin calls, start creating margin calls, and all of a sudden somebody yells fire, right? In a theater, everybody runs for the exit at the same time. Prices just go straight down. What I don't get is, you know, if you have a house, you can borrow against your house and you can borrow maybe, what, 70, 80% of the value of your house. If you have securities in a brokerage account, you can borrow maybe 50% of the value. But these hedge funds are borrowing like 30 times the value of their underlying securities that to me is just insane. That's even legal. And it happens over and over again. If you look at it through time, it's these leverage bets that these cowboys make or cowgirls make uh, that tend to just like make the market break down. Yeah. Well, it's like we all get that, except these hedge funds don't seem to get that. I mean, you know, like you said, it happened again in the great global financial crisis back in 2008. But if you look at like long term capital, you know, that guy blew up long term capital. Then he did the same thing three times over and had the same result. <laughs> Fool me once, you know, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, who are these people that keep giving these hedge fund guys and money to invest, Chris? I don't know, but they keep charging 2%. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other part of it, right? It's called OPM, other people's money. It's like, hey, <laughs> I'm going to make a big bet. If this works out, great. We're all going to make money. But guess what? If it doesn't work out, I still make money. <laughs> so it's good. it's good to be a hedge fund manager. Well, it's kind of what you call in our business a moral hazard, guys. Um, so it's a, uh, you know, it's like when you when you least expect something to happen, right? It's like why are there unexpected moves in the financial markets? Unexpected, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly Chris. Right? So yeah. that's why we call them black swan events. Well, the good news is, guys, nothing has really changed, right? Fundamentally, stocks they're still making profits. We're having a great quarter. Uh, profits should accelerate again into next year. If companies keep making money, what are they going to do? They're going to hire more workers. So the unemployment rate should still stay relatively low. Okay, 4.3% versus 4.1%. I don't think it's fallen off a cliff. Um, and economic growth, if you look at it right now, it's still tracking to be pretty high again this year, higher than it was the last decade. So you know, overall, we have pretty good financial conditions. Well, yeah. And then you also, if you couple that you know, with the fact that interest rates are probably going to come down in September, 
You know, Rye, you can finally buy that mansion that you've always dreamed of. Well, you know, you have all these um, bearish economists who have been so wrong for the last couple of years. And the thing is, you know, when the facts change, I change my mind. I don't know about you guys, right? <laughs> uh, but these economists that just keep looking for, you know, negative news, they were so gleeful, as you said, Rye, the other day, they were so gleeful that they had some negative news. It only created 114,000 jobs versus 175,000 expected. Uh, you know, the economy is still growing. So, you know, these are, I think the thing that was unusual was how there was no volatility this year. I think that's the thing that was really uh, kind of, you know, confusing. Which I enjoyed, but we know that's not real. <laughs> it's not realistic. I mean, you're right, Bob. That's my biggest pet peeve. Like you have these quote unquote strategist economists like rooting for the market to do poorly, rooting for the economy to do poorly. And they get super excited when the news is bad. Like that's offensive to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, and I'm watching the Olympics, you know, we love track and we're seeing all these American athletes just kicking butt. Like I want the U.S. to do well. <laughs> you know, I'm cheering America on. Um, and I feel like these economists do the exact opposite. And, you know, luckily, gladly, they're typically wrong. And I suspect, again, they're going to be wrong about where the economy is going. They're still calling for recession. And it just doesn't look like that's in the cards. Well, you can't fault them 100 percent. At least they're at least they're committed into what they and what they believe. Well, you know the wonderful thing about you know having a uh, a business as large as we do is we have people from different backgrounds all over the world, all over the country. And what doesn't change is human nature. I mean, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, you know, I had clients begging me to sell all our bonds and put it all into tech stocks. Um, like people begging me, you know, to let them invest in the most speculative area of the market. I guarantee if I call them up right now, they say, well, I'm going to wait and see, right? So the sentiment, it's, it's, it switches so quickly, like really at a, at a, you know, flip of a coin is how people invest based on their emotions. Well, you know, it's interesting, Bob, you know, if you look at perceptibly the world's greatest investor, of course, next to you, Warren Buffett, you know, he recently sold off. 50% of Apple stock in the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio. Rumor has it, Dad, you told him to do that. Well, Ryan's actually been telling him to do it. He's actually been criticizing Warren Buffett, you know, my hero for the last couple of years, which, you know, really made me concerned. But he's right. I mean, he let his portfolio, one position, grow to 50% of his holdings. That's not asset allocation. That's gambling. Yeah. So bottom line is, look, you have to have a discipline. You've got to stick to your discipline. Keep emotion out of it. And the unexpected is going to happen. So you've got to be prepared ahead of time. That's building a portfolio for success. Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, tied to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And of course, that's P-A-Y-N-A, -A, the folks at home. And guys, you know, there's a really good article this past week in Barron's, which we read every weekend, us financial people, uh, talking about the 4% withdrawal rate. And there's a financial theory that you can comfortably take 4% of your money in retirement every year, and you comfortably won't run out of money. And there's a lot of fallacies <laughs> around this, this myth of how well this can work and how neat it works. 
But I thought we could talk to you about how relevant is the 4% rule today? And is it actually something we actually apply in our financial planning and our practice for our clients? Well, you know, speaking of fallacies, right? I always thought the 4% rule was the maximum return that you would ever get your clients. <laughs> you know what, Chris? Under promise, over deliver. <laughs> yes. It's, uh, it's why we don't let clients call the shots, Chris. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know, truth be told, that, that the fellow that came up with this idea was a certified financial planner, and he's now adjusted the withdrawal rate to 4.7%. I'm announcing today the Bob Payne rule of thumb is 4.8%. I'm going to go <laughs> one up on him. What do you think of that, Chris? I guess you're paying for dinner this weekend, Bob. Yeah. I guess so. But uh, you know, the thing it does, it doesn't factor in are two things. Number one, the volatility of the markets, um, you know, taxation, inflation, you know, how you title your assets. And um, it doesn't factor in the emotions of the client. Look, I, every meeting I've been in over 50 years, a client's always promised, I won't panic. I won't panic. <laughs> well, here's the other problem. It's, it's the sequence of returns, which is yes. a fancy way of saying, let's just say you retire tomorrow and then the market sells off dramatically. And now you have to sell all your assets at a loss. And we had a client who came to us recently and said, hey, guys, I want to get way more aggressive with my strategy. I want to quote unquote make hay when the sun is shining. And what that really means is I want to put all my money into semiconductor stocks <laughs> right now. You know, I had, a, I, had a, I had a conversation with a client similar to that, Rye, and it just the next day, the Biden administration announced they may take draconian measures on preventing semiconductor manufacturers from selling to China. Stocks like Glam Research are down 25% since then. And the market's at an all-time record high. Well, there you go. That's that's the point. Um, is I said, look, we can put your money in all those stocks. We can build you a Ferrari. We build you a Volvo because that's what you want it, and that's what we think you need. But the problem with a Ferrari is once in a while it spins out of control. And the problem is I can't predict the magic day when the market's going to sell off. And that's the big problem with getting really aggressive with your money is you live by the sword, you die by the sword, and all of a sudden you die by the sword, and you got to draw from your portfolio. That can ruin the returns for the rest of your life. Well, you know what, Ryan? Remind me never to get into a car in a Ferrari with you. Uh, I certainly <laughs> don't want to spin out of control. But yeah, I mean, it, you know, going back to things being unpredictable, you know, our clients are unpredictable. I talked to a client of mine last night, and uh, they have every toy possible. I never thought they could buy another toy, and out of the blue, they said they want to buy a brand new boat, and that wasn't part of the plan. And that's definitely not four percent of their portfolio this year. I'm going to guess well above four percent of the portfolio. Yeah. So when you withdraw, it's not going to be linear over time either, right? Your needs are going to be different at different times. But going back to that client, I showed them if they went into a more aggressive portfolio and we had a big sell-off, even after that sell-off, if they got like 9 10% return a year, which is way higher than we projected for them because they have a conservative portfolio, they never make it back. In fact, they run out of money in like 10 years because you never recover if all of your portfolio goes down big and a big bear market, and you have to withdraw from your portfolio and not giving your shares the opportunity to, to recover again. Yeah, you talk about sequence of returns. How about the sequence of your career, Rye? You started <laughs> your first year in the business, the market dropped 50%. <laughs> 10 years later, the market dropped 50% again. Um, and well, within seven years, right? You had two, two 50% returns within seven years. And of course, people say, well, that's not possible. That can't be repeat. That can't happen again. Well, of course it can. And, and that's the thing you just can't model. No, you can't. But what you can do um, is you can create a portfolio with not just diversification. You know, diversification is not for real investors. Max diversification, um, you know, for people that drive Avos and are smart, Chris, not Ferraris. But no, the point is, you know, if you properly diversify your portfolio, you're never going to get hit. You're never going to get caught with the tide going out swimming naked when you're drawing from your portfolio. Because if you have money spread out well enough, you're not going to have everything down at the same time ever. That's how you build a portfolio that you can live off of in retirement. And that's why you can't do this on the back of a napkin, right? You need sophisticated tools, you know, like there are wealth projection tools because you got to factor in inflation. You got to factor in, you know, what if you take some of that retirement money uh, that's in your 401k, your IRA, and you do some uh, Roth conversions in those years when you're a lower bracket, right? And, you know, buy municipal bonds over taxable treasury bonds. You know, it's really about titling your assets properly, I think, Chris. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing, too, is, you know, one thing that doesn't get factored in, you know, if you run, you assume 4% drawing your portfolio, you might have so much money left at the end. You know, a lot of clients want to give to their families. You know, a good tax strategy would be to, you know, get money out of the estate, you know, make sure the next generation is taken care of. Well, that's probably what's happening right now. The savings rates at the lowest ever because the baby boomers, 
um, they're spending down, you know, their retirement and enjoying themselves or traveling like crazy. What we just find out from your cousin in Barcelona that the, um, the residents of Barcelona are shooting the tourists with water pistols. They're so sick of American tourists, <laughs> you know, and meanwhile, the, you know, the next generation saying, Hey, I don't have to save as much because look how much mom and dad's going to leave me. I heard that was Chris's plan, but I digress. <laughs> No, but I think what you have to think about too is a good point, right? Like for, for a lot of us, if our estate is at a certain size, you want to give way more than 4% away on an annual basis just because you don't want to get hit with estate taxes. So, you know, it gets way more complex. And furthermore, you know, money you take out of a retirement account is way more expensive than money you take out of savings or brokerage account because you still have to pay taxes on that. So you have to factor that into your 4% withdrawal every year. So it's just not linear. The other thing to think about too is, you know, a lot of these hot stocks today, you know, they were down like 30%, 40% just two years ago. Um, in that same year, had you had energy exposure in your portfolio, commodities, you had places you could have drawn from if you were retired. But if you had all your money in the same place, like the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, you know, that could have really, if you retired that year, you start drawing from your portfolio, man, oh man, you could have screwed up your entire retirement because you didn't diversify properly. And that's the biggest problem we see today with pretty much anyone coming in the door is not having that proper diversification, you know, really mitigating that sequence of returns or the risk of sequence of returns. Well, you know, I just read a research piece from my old firm and they talked about back in 2009, you know, when we launched paying capital management, you know, the average percentage of a, an investor's portfolio was 39% equities. It's now closing in at an all-time record high. And what's even more frightening is that the beta of the portfolio is the highest in history. In other words, it's going to be more volatile depending on where the market goes. You know, in, in plain English, guys, if the market goes down, they're going to go down a lot. And the only, and as you like to say, Bob, risk is only known in hindsight. Oh, yeah. So I think more than ever, when you're in this big booming bull market like we are, you've got to reassess now while the wind's at your back, you know, what underlying risks do I have? When the music stops, am I protected? And I'm willing to bet most of you have definitely not had that you know, analysis run, but it's so critical and it's more critical than ever right now because we are starting to see a lot of people taking more risk than they should be. And they're going to feel a lot of pain later, no pun intended, Chris. Yeah. So I think what it comes down to is, you know, 4%, as we said, it's a rule of thumb, but it's not the ultimate rule. You know, that's why it's so important that you should plan based on your goals and have a withdrawal plan that's based on your lifestyle, your goals, and your family. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, Hendrix Bessenbinder discovered that four out of every seven stocks in the US have underperformed cash or one month T bill since 1926. And just 4% of companies accounted for all the wealth gains for the entire stock market over that same time frame. Man, oh man, 4% of stocks. That's insane. Yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of question that research, right? Because I see like the equal weight S and P has done better than capitalization weighted S and P over that time frame. But I do know one thing for sure: anytime I have a good friend or a client who wants to speculate on an individual stock, I always have them put it in their taxable account because for some reason they're able to find those four out of seven that don't go up. And I uh, end up writing them off as a tax loss. Yeah, well, and, and also, I mean, if you're a professional money manager, to beat an index, man, oh man, that is not an easy job, not one that gets uh, accomplished very often. So, Chris, Taiwan accounts for more than 90% of the world's most advanced chip manufacturing, but Intel is building up production capacity in the US. Are we finally going to bring that semiconductor capacity home? It was just like the saying back in the 80s. By American. <laughs> no one said that in the 80s, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> By Japanese. I think Bob had a Japanese stereo system, Japanese car. The list goes on, Bob. Yeah, that was a, that was a big revelation. Suddenly everybody, everybody's wondering, why did the Japanese stock market go up so high? And I said, well, look out in your driveway. What are you, what are you driving? And every single person <laughs> was driving a Japanese car. You know, it's like sometimes it's real evident where the economy is going, just look yeah. in your driveway. Well, you know, our listeners may not know this, but Bob was always on the cutting edge of technology. And I remember in 1986, he walked to the front door with a Sony CD player. Oh, yeah. But Bob drove a Jaguar. So uh, that's definitely not a Japanese car. Everybody has to own a Jaguar once. <laughs> Only once. It's about as close as to royalty as we'll ever get. <laughs> 
it did have the actual real Jaguar on the front. Remember that? It was, it looked pretty fancy, pretty spicy. Oh, yeah. All right, Bob, global buyout shops are sitting on a record amounts of dry powder, $1.2 trillion in 2023, up $800 billion from 2019, according to a Bain Incorporated report. That capital has been piling up faster than worthy acquisition targets can be found. More than a quarter of buyout shops capital has been sitting around uninvested for four years or more, up from 18% in 2019. Man, oh man, there's a lot of private equity out there. Well, there's been a lot of private equity piling up, Ryan. And, and we kind of called that shot a couple of years ago when, when suddenly we, we our phone was ringing off the hook with all these special deals that these institutions were suddenly offering us, but it doesn't look like it panned out so well. But, you know, after speaking to Joe last week and talking about hedge funds, for example, you know, sometimes when things think they're special, they're hot for a little, especially you know, for a short period of time. But, you know, when nine out of 10 end up going out of business, not usually a great idea. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's not a good sign. When nine of your 10 hedge fund shops are going out of business, probably buyer beware. <laughs> So, hey, hope you enjoyed episode 170, Hard to Believe, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, you love our podcast, please give us a five-star rating. If it's on iTunes, Spotify, you can subscribe. If this is on YouTube right now, you can subscribe as well. You can like this episode. Any positive feedback you give us, spread the word, gives us the ability to continue to do this podcast. We appreciate your support. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully, you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Pain Capital Management, at bebullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Pain Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed.